Okay, Rafael, will you please start your your presentations on okay. active learning? Okay. Like active, active deep learning. Yeah. 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 Hello, everyone. Today I'll present the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I need to close this. Media uh, is recorded. Okay. Uh, today I'll present a paper based in generative. Eh? I think it's, it's quite fine for us to, to see your slides. So, so you didn't say this meeting is being recorded, this pop-up window. Uh, because from my, from my side, the pop-up window is there. You can just click OK. Um, <laughs> you, you can rejoin this meeting. Or you can first stop sharing and then sharing again. Or, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, everything fine? Yeah. Okay. And this paper is published in ICML 2019. The researchers are from University of Adelaide. Their research focused mainly on um, computer vision, robotic vision, active learning, Bayesian statistics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. So the motivation of this paper is that deep learning model usually can be widely adopted in many fields of study, such as NLP, computer vision, robotic, and has very good performance. But one problem is that DNA needs immense amount of label data. Thus, an important research direction is how to train an effective model with smaller set of label data. There are two different approaches. The first one is data augmentation. Data augmentation tries to add some random transformation on data during training. So the model will not see exactly the same picture more, more than once. So if we do data augmentation, this can avoid overfitting. Okay, so the idea yeah. is that to improve the generalizability of the model. So when we train a model, we not just like, we, we, we would like to avoid a case where the model will just remember every sample. And when we count the new samples, the model can have, we will have a bad performance. We would like the model to have the capability of generalize. So given new samples, you can still based on the past knowledges to make a correct prediction. Okay, hmm. and data augmentation will be one of them. Hmm. Hmm. And the second approach is called active learning. So active learning tries to select only informative samples from unlabeled data. And this informative sample will be sent to Oracle to label so we can save the labeling resources. And then we merge those sample into training database and train the classifier. So maybe you can be more, more have more explanation on the graph there. Yeah, so first we start with a small classifier, maybe train on small set of label data and also we have a large pool of unlabeled data. Then somehow we can design a metric to select the most informative samples from unlabeled data pool. Then this set of samples will be sent to the Oracle and inside the Oracle, um, human, human are, sitting, are sitting there to label this data. So this label data will be sent back to the machine learning model. Then machine learning model can use the new batch of data to train. Mm. Yeah, so the idea here is, is that um, giving, we would like to, so, so if we would like to train a model, we can either train with maybe 5,000 samples, or maybe we can train with uh, 10,000 samples maybe train, train a model with 10,000 and 5,000 have the same effect. It is because the 5,000 samples has already informative, as informative 
as a tensile examples. And yeah. and when we prepare mm -hmm. the data, it it, it it was quite uh, laborious or it's quite uh, time consuming or uh, effort consuming to label the data. So here comes the question that uh, how could we label as less simple as possible and try to model as accurate as possible. So so active living is going to do this. It's trained a preliminary models, and this model can perform where on a small set small set of data that data. And based on that model, we going to find it. Um, it's going to go, it's going to find whether this model lacks something and what is most informative uh, sample the model haven't been noticed. So then we feed those samples into the model to correct it. It's it's fairly like the human human the process of human learnings. If we are doing a test, when we so the active learning process is more like give you a test. And you find that you are correct in eight tests, and eight, eight questions, and the two, uh, you 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 didn't perform well on the two questions. So these two questions are the most informative questions for the people to learn, and so it keep feeding the que the questions incur the wrong performance of the model, then the model can keep improving itself. So this process is called like active learning. Mm. Okay. 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 So, if there are any questions, you can you are free to ask. So, um, this paper is trying to combine both approach to boost the performance of model. So, the overall big picture is like this. Uh, first, I use active learning to select informative sample X star. Then I label X star. I give it a label Y star, maybe. Um. Then I will use some data augmentation technique to generate another X prime based on X star. And this X prime is as informative as X star. Then I have X star and X prime and I merge them into training. So I only need to label once, but I can double the number of informative samples. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's fairly clear. So. The point is that if we just adopt the traditional active learnings and it's a sample we selected, maybe it's just occupy a very small number. It may be not as influenced, it's not as influenced as effective. So by this means, when we select the samples, when we select samples by active learnings, we apply data augmentation approach to enlarge its influence in the training process. Yeah. So that is the rationale of this work, mm. right? Mm. Mm. So the problem scope of this paper is training model with small label set with both data augmentation and active learning approach. Um, there are a few challenges. The first one is that how do we design the active learning strategy? Because in active learning, we need to have a metric to measure informativeness. In practice, we measure informativeness by uncertainty. That means if the model is uncertain, is uncertain about an example, then that example is considered as informative because if we add it into training, that may improve the model's performance and generalizability. And second challenge is how do we combine the data annotation with active learning? Mm, so here is is there any other, yeah, so I think, so here it means that one of the contribution of this paper is that they maybe propose a more novel way to define the informativeness. Mm. 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 No, I think the combination of data annotation with active learning is the contribution here. Okay. But the definition of informativeness is coming from previous work. Mm. Okay. So the approach overview is that um, the paper uses Bayesian active learning to select an informed example. And they use VAE is again as the data augmentation technique to generate another example based on the selected sample. And this new 
generated example is as informative as the selected sample. So first I will introduce what is Bayesian active learning. Um, you might have heard of the Bayesian versus frequentist debate in probability theory. Uh, basically, when we want to build a probabilistic model, PY given X and W, the interest is to estimate W because W is unknown. From frequentist point of view, we will obtain a point estimate of W called W hat based on what we observed. But from Bayesian point of view, everything is uncertain. So I will estimate the distribution of W instead of a single fixed value based on my observation D. So we will see an example. Suppose we have a cone and the cone might be fair or unfair, we don't know. It has probability theta of getting head and we want to estimate this theta. To estimate, we can just throw it for six times and we observe five heads followed by a tail. If I'm a frequentist, I will simply estimate the probability of hat being equal to five over six. But that's, that's a very extreme estimation. What if I have a prior belief that the coin shouldn't be too unfair? Oh, so by, by the way, I still need to pause a little bit to ask someone whether I can follow this. Hey, Xiangling, mm -hmm. are you there? So, mm -hmm. so can you... Uh, Maybe you have learned this before, just uh, ask in case you miss this. Mm -hmm. So so here is using the maximum likelihood estimation idea. So of course, it's throw six times and observes the five times of the head. So the frequency is, is five over six. So here about the, so, so you get a point of this theta to five times one minus theta. So this is actually a bi binomial. It's a binomial probability. It's Bernoulli. Um, Bernoulli, so yeah. So each yeah. is Bernoulli. Mm. Yeah. So you just time mm. it together, then you'll get the mm. likelihood. Mm. The likelihood function is that, uh, su suppose we, we have a theta, then what is the likelihood of having this observation? Mm. which is simply given by this theta to the power of five um, because you observe five times of head. Mm. Um, do you mean that you you do a lot of um, experiment, like you throw it six times and you do it over and over again and you found out the probability of it is five over six and, and then that's how you calculate theta? Um, or... so suppose we only throw six times and then we estimate theta. Mm, so point is here. So that is that is t that is about the concept of maximum likelihood <laughs> estimation. So if so, given that so anyway, if we would like to throw the if we like to given the probability of theta's, we know that if we would like to have these observations, and uh, the formula of the of the formula of this probability is theta to five times one minus theta, right? Yeah. And then the idea is that given this formula, we would like to maximize this value. Yeah, so so we want to and, find mm. for what kind of theta mm. observing this particular observation is the most likely. Yeah, mm. then, then we're using the, maybe using the calculus, we know that when theta equals five over six, and this formula will take the maximum value. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's the idea of the maximum likelihood estimation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is somehow, I think that is the undergraduate, undergraduate um, prob probability theory or statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So somehow I just want to mention everyone can follow this part. That will be important, especially for the AI, if you want to explore mm -hmm. AI topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going on. Mm, okay, so this is uh, what the frequentist will do. Uh, like, like here I talk about the problem. 
is that if we believe the coin shouldn't be too unfair, then how do we incorporate my prior belief? The way is using Bayesian approach. So we introduce a prior distribution for theta. Suppose I think somehow theta should be roughly around 0 0.5. Then I can assume my probability distribution of theta will be normally distributed and centralized 0 0.5. Then based on my observation D, I will adjust the prior distribution. Then the adjustment after, uh, then the distribution after the adjustment becomes posterior distribution. So the formula is given by this. Uh, if we visualize- uh, let, let's, look at the, let's look at the formula again. Maybe you can explain the formula a bit as well. Uh, this is just Bayesian rule. Ah. Uh, so this is my prior, right? And my likelihood is given by probability distribution of D given theta. So if I want to compute the posterior distribution, then it's just applying base. Oh, so just just uh, just a base in base yeah, in yeah. base in yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. So uh, how it looks like in graph is that suppose the blue curve is prior distribution and the green curve is likelihood, then the posterior distribution is somewhat distributed between prior and likelihood. So you can imagine Bayesian tries to take a balance between observation and prior to make sure that the posterior will not be too distorted by observation. Mm. Hmm. So there are several nice properties of using Bayesian. Because Bayesian estimates a distribution instead of a single fixed value, so we will derive a distribution instead of a single number that will introduce some kind of uncertainty. And second thing, with Bayesian, we are able to incorporate any prior information we have about the parameter. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, you can think about it as a regularization because we will, not, we will not get extreme estimation if we try to include prior into our consideration. Mm, but, but the challenge is that we need to know what is prior, right? The user prior. has to define, yeah. And what uh, is prior, so, so we have to now- Yeah, uh, usually like um, you have a set of distribution you can choose from and mm. If you, yeah, based on experience, yeah, okay. Based on your expertise, you can just choose your prior. I don't think it's a mm. very difficult thing here. Okay. Yeah. Or, or if you don't have any prior knowledge, you just assume it to have a uniform distribution that is also. Um, so here I prepare a question is that when I have only few observations, is MLE estimation better or Bayesian estimation better? Yeah, that's a good question. So you can just pinpoint someone to answer. Hmm. Maybe Wang Chou? Uh, from me, Bayesian is better because uh, operation is too few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So mm. because if we have few observation, then the data we have are unreliable. So I should rely more on my prior belief. Uh, on the other hand, when the number of observation is large, actually uh, you can use either. Mm. The Bayesian has a priori, right? Yeah, Bayesian has prior. But the your observation, the observation means that the the posterior. The observation means the posterior, right? Means the number of D you have. Yeah. Means the likelihood. 
Yeah, but so given that, so your point is that we have less experience. Yeah, because we have, we have, we have so so here so yes uh, so we have two parts. The first part is the pre, that is experience. Experience means that we have the uh, uh, priori. Oh yeah. And observation means about the uh, observation means that or just like observations. Mm. If have less. If we have less observations, we are purely based on experience. So yeah, then we're choosing the Bayesian. Yeah, that's the reason we choose Bayesian. I mean, when observation, the, the number of observations, events is small, is small. Yeah. We're choosing Bayesian, right? Yeah, we should choose Bayesian. Uh, one cost answer is MLE or- Huh? So one cost answer is Bayesian. Oh, one cost answer is Bayesian, or maybe I- oh. Sorry, I understood it. Okay. Oh. But you have, uh, if you have many observations, then MLE estimation will also be quite good. Mm. So you can choose either based on your preference. Um, so, but what if, um, what if you only have a few observations, but what if you have some outliners? Would that affect a lot? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for example, here you only have six trials and you maybe observe those has just out of luck. If you use MLE, then you will get very extreme estimation. But if you incorporate prior, then somehow this outlier will be canceled. The effect of it will be canceled. Hmm. So maybe I can ask another question. Hmm. Is transfer learning an MLE estimation or a Bayesian estimation? Bayesian. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not asking. Huh? Maybe I can ask one. Oh. Okay. So maybe you Yifan, you Yifan, you are you there? Hello, Yifan, are you there? Yeah. So the so my question is that is transfer learning a Bayesian estimation or MLE estimation, and why? Transformer. Transfer learning. Transfer learning. Transfer learning. Transfer learning. Uh, I don't know about transfer learning. What is transfer learning? Uh, Rob, can you explain what is transfer learning? Uh, transfer learning is like, suppose you pre-train your classifier in a large data set, and then you fine-tune the pre-trained classifier on your own data set. Oh, Bayes, because you have some prior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. So, so here I think everyone has understand the uh, MLE estimation and based here. So let's keep going on. Yeah. Um. This is how Bayesian is different from traditional probabilistic model, and Bayesian idea can also be applied in deep learning. For a normal deep learning model, the weights estimation are fixed, but for a base DNN, uh, this this sentence is quoted from the paper. All weights in Bayesian neural network are represented by probability distributions over possible values, rather than having a single fixed value. Mm -hmm. hmm. So for Bayesian DN, what you get is the estimation of posterior distribution of your weight. And given the test input, except the prediction is also not a single number, but a distribution called predictive distribution. And this is the formula of predictive distribution. It's just the integral of predicted value at each W. So it's like I'm taking the weighted average of prediction on every possible value of W. Mm. Hmm. So, yeah, so you need, yeah. Uh, somehow you sum to you sum up, sum up them together to get the final probability distribution. Yeah. Right. Mm. Mm. And uh, you can imagine Bayesian DNA is like infinite example of standard DNA models because you have infinite many combination of W. And, and because, because the design of base and DN. So the way to train it is also different from normal DNN. If you are interested in further details in training, you can read this paper, Weights Uncertainty in Neural Network. 
Mm. Mm. So now suppose I don't bother to train the network in Bayesian way, and I only have a normal neural network. Is it possible to convert it to Bayesian neural network? And the answer is yes. Actually, a network with dropout enabled is a Bayesian DNN because each weight parameter will follow Bernoulli distribution. If it is dropout, then the weight is equal to zero. If it is not dropout, then the weight is equal to your estimated value, your, your, your uh, weight parameter after training. So if you have M weights to be dropout, then you have two to the power of M weights different dropout, then you have two to the power of ensemble models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, be because um, I want to talk about basic active learning. So I will also briefly introduce what is active learning. Act uh, the intuition is that Data labeling is costly, so we want to only label those most informative example. The informative means we select example that the model is uncertain about. How do we quantify uncertain? Okay, there are two definitions. The first definition is that the model is not confident. That means the sample lies near the decision boundary. The second definition is that if I have n ensemble models and those ensemble models disagree. Mm. Mm. So now we can combine Bayesian and active learning together. Bayesian active learning is a Bayesian approach to quantify the uncertainty in deep neural network. Given a model M, this is the model trained on small training set. And the random X from unlabeled data pool, we want to select X such that the uncertainty function A is maximized. There are two terms in the uncertainty function. The first term is H of Y given X D. This, um, this y given x d is the predictive oh, distribution. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Maybe I, I missed a little bit. So what is d? D is a pool, right? Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry. D is the training data that it, that we already label. Mm. Mm. X is unlabeled. Pool is unlabeled. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And h here means entropy. So we call that Bayesian NN will produce predicted distribution rates. Mm -hmm. And a natural way to quantify the uncertainty in predicted distribution is by computing the entropy. Mm -hmm. If a distribution has high entropy, that means the distribution has heavy tail. So the model is more uncertain. Mm -hmm. Mm Uh, but maybe I asked this a little bit earlier. So somehow, mm -hmm. given that you introduced uh, a strategy of dropout enabled, it means that it's somehow very hard to train a Bayesian DNN. We can only estimate the Bayesian DNN based on a enabling based on enabling the dropout options on a normal DNN. Am I right? Mm, yeah. Okay, so it's very hard. So, so giving your example that giving the mm. Bayesian DNN, uh, given the Bayesian DNN, each weight is actually a distribution, right? Yeah. It's a distribution, and mm. the, each and for a network, it actually it's a integral or yeah, a combination yeah, yeah. of many distribution. Mm. So, so it's maybe intractable. That's why later I will introduce how do we mm. approximate this uncertainty function mm. by using dropout. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, the second term is a little bit tricky here because here we are taking the 
expectation of entropy in prediction over all possible theta. It can measure the agreement of ensemble model. Uh, recall that if the first term is large, that means uh, the model is uncertain about the example. And then if the second term, if the second term is small, the overall quantity, the overall difference will be large, right? Oh, let me read again the expectation uh, of entropy. Is uh, so oh, here so, we are taking, suppose we are taking a particular theta and theta, we get so, the so predicted. What is, what, what, what is the theta stands for the parameter? Is it means, uh, theta is the parameter in the, network or the weight. Mm. Mm. Okay, so, so it's combining two kinds of the uncertainty. The first is the uncertainty, it's so giving a theta. So mm. giving, giving a theta, it, it predicts how uncertain the prediction Y is. Yeah. And then it then it's going to predict it. Um, so, okay, so then it's going to, given a Y and X, it's going to predict how uncertain theta it is. Uh, actually, no. Actually, no. no, I will, I will explain. Because you're actually uh, predicting the theta, right? Given D is going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we want to see whether the model is currently uncertain about the prediction Y. Mm. So I still get confused so, yeah. about the latter part, the expectation part. Uh, I haven't finished my explanation. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, so if the first term is large and second term is small, then the overall quantity is large, right? Mm. And the second term is small, could be due to that for some particular theta, it pulls down the average entropy, right? Mm. Oh, you mean um, if for specific unlabeled data X, if the entropy is high, you still need to check if it's because of uh, this specific X or because of some on some parameters, right? Mm. Are, are you trying to say that? Um. Mm. Mm. So, so I'm asking, <laughs> so I, have, I have a question here. Yeah. Oh, so giving an X, right? And for, mm -hmm. for giving your formulas, X, actually D is fixed, right? D is fixed. And a C, and a, and a, and a Y, after we train a model, Y theta is not fixed. Theta is also fixed, right? Theta, theta is the distribution that follows posterior. But now we're taking a particular theta and we compute the entropy. And then we, we average this entropy uh, 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 over all possible theta. So this term is the expectation mm -hmm. of okay, so, entropy so, okay, for everything. So because you're yeah. talking about the base in the end, yeah. So each theta will have forms, each theta will form a distribution, right? Each theta will yeah. form a distribution. So, hmm. uh, I will have an example later, actually. Mm, okay. Oh, so I, <laughs> so, so the second term is small could be that some member of theta pulls down this average value, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the overall uncertainty is high, but then the expected value is low. It's because that for some particular ensemble member, the model is quite confident so that the average entropy is pulled down. Mm. Yeah, right. In other words, some ensemble member is confident, but while the other ensemble members are not confident. So the ensemble models disagree with each other. The second term corresponds to the second definition of uncertainty, and the first term corresponds to the first definition of uncertainty. Mm. But, but in terms of implementation, uh, if we would like to now give in x, uh, given x, we would like to calculate the entropy of y. We still need to have a lot of example data. Yeah. Uh, sorry, example model. So yeah, but 
because you have dropped out, right? Mm. So you can literally drop out capital T times, and this T is very large to approximate uh, this uh, entropy and this average of entropy. So here I have an example. Suppose I have three dropout models and they can output different Y hats. The first, uh, the Y hat that output by model one is 0 0.9, 0 0.1. By model two is 0 0.1, 0 0.9. Model three is 0 0.4, 0 0.6. If we want to compute the first term, because this is an example model, right? So yeah. the overall y hat will be just taking the average over three ensemble members, which is equal to this, right? Yeah. So then you compute the uncertainty of this y hat is 0 0.9974. So you can see that overall entropy is quite high because your predicted confidence is close to 0, 0 0.5. Right. Yeah, is that how you calculate the so you are calculating the average y? The average y hat. Why are you calculating the average y hat? I suppose you uh because you re you remember I when I introduced the formula of predictive distribution. It's actually a weighted average of prediction over all possible theta. Okay, so anyway, so we, we get an average hat. Yeah. Uh, so how you get in, so you have three example data. You will- I have three example models. Mm -hmm. Then how do you make the prediction? You just take the average, right? It also can be voting. Of course. Yeah, yeah but for but for, for now that like, we follow the formula. Okay, so we follow the formula. Yeah. We're getting okay, we get it. Okay, we, okay, so we yeah. we're giving the formula, we just take the average. <laughs> yeah, because um okay. Okay, so this we, corresponds we, to the formula in my okay, last slide. Right. So okay. we're, we're using this formula, we take the formula. Yeah. So we get a high entropy. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, please go down. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So this is for the first term, right? For the second term is, we take the expectation of entropy for every particular theta or for every particular example members. Then if you compute this, the result is 0 0.6363 because the average is pulled down by model one and model two because model one and two are confident. Mm -hmm. So that's why the second term will be small if my ensemble members disagree with each other. So if we combine two terms, this overall uncertainty is large. Mm, okay, so let me think yeah. about it. So so usually the for the average is 0 0.4, 0 0.6, close to these ones. So it was a very it has very high entropies. Mm -hmm. And giving and the, oh, okay, I somehow got a point. So mm -hmm. okay, so I, I got a point. So mm -hmm. here, so we we calculate the overall entropies, then we're gonna see the entropy average. As long the mm -hmm. smaller the expectations. Uh, the smaller the expectations, the, the more disagreement they have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. So I'm still somehow think, oh. thinking about some kind of examples of these formulas. Mm. But maybe they're right. Mm. I, I think this formula is a well established metric called mutual information information theory. Uh, again? Mutual information. Mutual information. Okay. Mm. Hmm. Actually, today my my presentation is also uh, related to virtual information. Yeah. Okay. So as, I think entropy or the information theory is very important. It's hmm. very important for our deep learning debugging and testing approach. So let's keep going on. Hmm. Yeah. So now so do I have, have, do you have any questions. Do you, have any, do you have any questions in these slides? I think this this part, the last slide, oh. is kind of interesting. 
Yeah, maybe. Actually, I only prepared mm. one question and I have already asked. Okay, you. okay I see. Mm. Mm. You go on. Oh, so I have already covered basic active learning. And now I will introduce what is VEEC GAN. Mm. Uh, this is the overall structure of VEEC GAN. It's the concatenation of VAE and AC GAN. Um, first, let's talk about what is AE and VAE. Uh, AE stands for autoencoder. Autoencoder can compress image into a latent variable Z. And the dimension of Z is usually much, much smaller than the dimension of input. And then we decompress it or recover an image from Z into X hat. So autoencoder has two parts, an encoder, which does dimension reduction and a decoder, which can recover information. And one way to design loss is the reconstruction loss. It tries to minimize the loss of information due to dimension reduction and information recovery. So we make sure that X and X hat are close. Huh? Keep going. I think let's post no questions on this slide. Mm. I think Xiaoling has been an expert in, in, <laughs> on, on this slide. Yeah. Um, but this design is actually prone to overfitting. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say an extreme case, for example, if Z is 1D, uh, one dimensional, which means a single number. Then I have capital N of training data. Then I just label them from one to N. So my Z is equal to one to N. Mm. Then my reconstruction mm. loss is essentially zero because you just enumerate all the training, right? Mm. Yeah, so, so, so that's why we need to multiple numbers. So, yeah, so so Xiaoling's work actually will would would reduce the dimension to two, so it may also in, incur some of these problems. Mm. Uh, so I I feel something like that. But anyway, we 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 need to keep this in mind and provide an argument. Mm. Mm. So variation of autoencoder tries to compress and decompress into a similar image yet blurry image because blurry can ensure some kind of regularization and allow some loss of information in reconstruction so that my model can generalize well on testing data mm. hey by the way something you're selling there yeah so when we do the visualization do we have the testing data testing data yeah so somehow because we train a UMAP, right? So there's a UMAP loss or reconstruction loss. So when we train mm -hmm. the data, we somehow need to separate the data into training set and testing set. We only yeah. train the tested, we only train it on testing set. Tra oh, sorry, only train it on the training set. Then we may need to use a model to predict whether uh, these decoding and encodings can be generalized to those testing data. Yeah, yeah, we we we've done that. We have done that. That and how about the testing accuracy? Testing accuracy. You you are asking me about the value of testing the accuracy. Yeah, so we do not need the exact number, but we still do you have an estimated number. Uh, I yeah, don't yeah, know. Yeah. So 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 Rofan just mentioned one very important point that if we reduce all the all the all all the high dimensional vectors into oh a vector of one dimension I mean, yeah. into a scalar that yeah. somehow will incur the overfitting right and somehow will incur the overfitting uh so i just a little bit i'm think about i'm think a little bit about whether our models because it's actually two dimensions mm. uh, will introduce some kind of overfitting issue so this might be a problem being attacked Yeah, so anyway, we need we need to experimentally show that we can avoid our training can avoid those kind of overfitting issues. Mm. 
Maybe we can yeah. note them to make sure we were we 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 are going to avoid or defend such attack. Mm. Yeah, maybe you can just report the testing accuracy of the reconstruction, the 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 AE our AE part uh, in the in the group. How? Oh? Yeah, you mean now? Okay. I I no, I, uh, I recall it should be over ninety percent, but I'm not so sure. Yeah, maybe you can have a double check to ensure that we do not incur overbidding issue. Mm, That's all. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. So the design of model architecture for variation auto encoder is that the encoder part now uh, do not directly output a latent variable Z, but it output uh, two parameters. The first one is mu x. Second one is sigma x. Then I sample my latent variable from a normal distribution with parameters mu x and sigma x. Mm -hmm. And the loss has two parts. The first one is the original reconstruction loss. The second one is a regularization term, which tries to uh, minimize the difference between mu x sigma x normal distribution and standard normal distribution. So this generated distribution cannot be too far away from standard normal. So um, you can understand it like this. It tries to regularize z to be around zero and with some variation. Also, each dimension of z shall capture independent information. So the idea is similar to L2 or L1 regularization, where you try to make the weight to be close to zero. Mm. Mm. Next thing about, uh, so it means that for every sample, it have to form the normal distribution uh, with mu as zero and the uh, Sigma S one, and you know that. So when we can when mm. we calculate the KL divergence, mm. so does it, does it mean that each time we train it, we need to sample multiple times from this mu and the delta? Uh, we only sample once. We only sample once. Yeah. If we only sample once, how do we calculate the KL divergence? Uh, here we are comp we are not computing KL divergence between Z and standard normal. But this distribution with standard normal. Mm, let me think about it. So it will output the mu and the, and the, and the sigma, yeah, right? Yeah. And do you mean that it, giving whatever x, it will always output a mu and uh, the yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. So it, does that mean that given an x, it, Okay, so that means so first we using dart to, to build a construction error, and that mm -hmm. then we for every x we just force it will be decoded into mu and uh, sigma. Mm. But each x will conform to different mu and sigma, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything about it? Uh, yeah. So given it, here given is your. Oh. Uh, the KR divergence. So if it's KR divergence, isn't, even in, isn't it that we let mu x to be zero and the sigma to be one, it is enough? You cannot exactly set set them to be exactly equal to zero and identity because you need to allow some variation. Yes, I understand we need to have some variations. Yeah, but and also you need to s somehow balance yeah, between yeah. the two terms. I understand. So suppose that we yeah. we get a get a one like zero. Mm. Uh, yeah. Maybe KL divergence is nicer. Is yeah. I'm just I just a bit curious yeah. about how how do we get I, I somehow for, um. Yeah. We only sample once. We only sample once. So yeah. sample once means that we get a one vector oh uh, no 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 this is a distribution this is not z mm. this is not z 
This is sample from this distribution. Yeah. Uh, this is the KL diversion between two distributions. And can you write the formula down? So I somehow forgot it. Um. Hmm. Ah. So I'm just cur very curious about these KL divergence laws. Is it like, uh, mm. eh? I also kind of forget what is the formula. Is it like log uh, Px uh, divided by Qx times Q, right? Times, times Q or times P? Times P, times P. Times P, times P, P, right? P. Times P. So, okay, so now I'm asking that I'm giving mu x in this, uh, my x, and how do we calculate p and q? Uh, you know the PDF for normal distribution, right? Yes. You just plug in. Just plug in. Hmm. Plug in. Uh, so, so how do we... Yeah. So, so the next, next question is... Like, <laughs> And, and, and giving this mu and x, and how do we calculate the PDF? Uh, the PDF for normal oh, distribution. I, I got it, I got it. So please, please keep going on. <laughs> let, me, let me warm my memory, warm, my, warm up my memory a little bit. Yeah. Uh, this is about AE and VAE. And uh, about no, gain. No, let's get, yeah. let's get back. We're, done. we're not done. We're not done. So I'm still, ask, I'm still lingering on this page here. Um, so when we calculate the Px, so Px is for, and, it, and in this scenario, where is, where is x? It's definitely not this x, right? It's not this x. It might be some x, some x else. You mean which x? Oh, let me write it down. So this is care divergence, right? So this is log px and the qx, right? Yeah. So I'm saying that how to- uh, This x you can replace by any character. So you mean the characters here? <laughs> because for, for PDF, you, for PDF, the x here does not matter. X I understand. is just a symbol, right? I understand. X is just a symbol. I understand it's simple, but it's a distribution, right? Yeah, it's Maybe a distribution. If it's a frequency, then we will already have some, some, some formula. We have some. And, right? Yeah, and then you just use the formula for normal distribution. You just use the PDF for normal distribution. You have two normal distribution. One is P, the other one is Q. Then you just compute the KR divergence. Okay. Oh, God, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Uh, okay, keep going on. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot find my mouse. Mm. Okay. Mm. So the next part is about game. Uh, GAN has the generator part and discriminator part. The generator for GAN takes an input vector and tries to generate a fake image. For example, it tries to generate a fake faces. And the discriminator tries to defend against generator. And a good discriminator can distinguish real example versus fake example. So there are two conflicting goal here. The first one is generator tries to fool discriminator because it wants to generate authentic images that looks like real images. On the other hand, discriminator tries to defend against the attack by generator. Okay. Hello. So, so keep going. So when I when I'm yeah. not asked, when there's no question, you can just. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, the loss function for gain looks like this. 
if we just treat this generator function as constant and we train for discriminator, then this loss function is just a binary cross entropy loss for discriminator. Because remember that discriminator tries to distinguish real versus fake. So it's a binary classification problem. Um, on the contrary, if we if we treat the discriminator function as constant and we focus on training the generator, then minimizing the loss is actually maximizing log of discriminator and generator is inside the, this function. Mm, let me repeat this one. Mm. Okay, so, okay, no problem. So, yeah. so this is just a goal for generator, right? It tries to fool the discriminator. Mm. Mm. And this is the formula for uh, yeah. let's see, uh, let's huh? see the generator. So that means we need to, when we train the generators, generators were trying to uh you have to discriminate and, and this is just a lot for discriminator right for, for both, both, for both the discriminator yeah. and the generator but it's yeah. but but for discriminator it's going to minimize this function and for generator is trying to maximize this function am i right uh, yeah not? but if you maximize this then you are eh? If you maximize this, then you are minimize mm. this, right? Mm. So it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, think... same formula. Mm. But yeah, depending on which part you're focusing on, if you focus on generator, then you can think of discriminator as some fixed function. Yeah. Mm. Keep going on, keep going. Mm. Mm. Uh, so AC gain is a variation from gain. Uh, it has three parts, generator, discriminator, and classifier. One special thing about generator is that it takes an input vector, but also a class. So it can generate fake images based on specific class. For example, I want to generate a fake dog image. Mm. Then after that, the discriminator is trying to distinguish real or fake example. And the classifier tries to classify the class. Mm. The class the A, for the A. AC against A is means auxiliary, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, auxiliary. auxiliary. And, what's the, the, and then what's the difference between uh, AC again and C again? Mm. I, I don't know. Okay. Keep mm. going on. So I, I somehow remember this AC GAN doing their auxiliary is somehow integrate uh, self attention layers in generator. Mm, I don't know. Okay, keep going on. Mm. So VE AC GAN tries to combine VE and AC GAN together such that the decoder in VE is also the generator in AC GAN. Mm -hmm. So we use the image generated from VE as the fake image for discriminator in AC GAN. The nice properties are good VE can generate more realistic fake image that is more informative for AC GAN discriminator training. And also the training of AC GAN can improve the recovery ability for VAE because uh, the generator is trained such that uh, it, it tries to compromise discriminator. So the discriminator cannot distinguish it's a real image or not. 
So GAN's purpose is just to make sure the images is in the is, is in the distribution, mm. right? But the for VAE, isn't it just the same job? It's just a decoder. It just provide a decoder. And can you repeat again how the how the VAE and again are compromise can 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 complement with, with each other? Mm. Because when we generate image, it, it generates <coughs> from the original image X, right? Mm -hmm. But so when we, when we train, when we train yeah. VAE, we start with the uh, original X. Yeah. But I, I think the VAE AC GAN has an improvement over AC GAN because it can take the input of uh, image X instead of a uh, latent vector. And if you take uh, image as input, you will generate more authentic X prime. Mm. That, that, so, so the training on this is like this, we train a VAE first. So that means we get a power for- mm. I think you can try it interchangeably. Mm. Yeah. Interchangeably. I mean, when you are updating the ways. And what's the benefits if we using uh, if after we using GAN to update the to update the decoders? And what's the benefits for VAE and M1? So, so one of the so one of my thoughts is that so when we train a generator mm. or when we train a GAN, it is quite often that the GAN will have the uh will have the the learning, the, the high learning or the learning curve, the model will have a learning curve. That means the discriminator will perform so much better than the generator. So when, mm. uh, when the generator generated in images and the discriminators will always accurate predict it is through giving a, the, or, or the, the discriminator will give in uh, evolution information as either zero or one. That means because it, just, it was so easy to drop to distinguish real and a false, real and a false, real and a fake. And it will be quite a difficult job for us to synthesize uh, vivid images, mm. right? Mm. So, so it will have a learning curve. Once the discriminator, for example, if the, if the discriminator keep give, giving 0 0.2, 0 0.3, then the GAN will have a chance to, ev to evolve. But just like uh, someone, just like student, keep taking the examples, it always get a score of zero it have no idea which direction to go, right? So in this case, we provide a VAE. So we make mm. the students maybe at least can have a score of 60 at the very beginning. And then it makes the generator or makes the capability of generator and the capability of this combinator somehow com com competitive. In this yeah. case, it can facilitate the training process again. Mm. So that's yeah, the yeah. idea I, I think about it. I, I agree, I agree. So yeah, that's I, my I, first point here because I think a good way you can generate hard example for GAN. Hard example for um, Because this image will look more um, real. So your point is that it can generate yeah. a harder example for discriminator, but an easier job for generator. Right. Yeah, 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 because you share the yeah, so the point that generator we, with the point, the point is so. that will create a balance between the discriminator oh, yeah. and the generator. Right? Yeah. Hmm. And what do you mean by more informative? Informative for AC game. A hard example. Hard example. Okay. Okay. That's point. That, that's I get the point. Okay. So let's go with your second point. Training AC again also improves the and why 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 this is the why this is the case because. If we because, but because the good generator can fool the discriminator, right? Mm -hmm. So which means the the your recovered image is quite good. Looks very similar to your original X. So discriminator cannot tell the difference. But this is a goal of GAN. The, the goal of VAE is just to reconstruct, is just to reconstruct the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but for VAE, you want to minimize the reconstruction error. 
So I'm thinking maybe AC GAN can in turn help to minimize this reconstruction is that, error. Is that what written in paper or is that your imagination? It's my, my, my thought. Oh, that's your thought, okay. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure whether this is correct because giving the, the, the object, objective function of VAE, mm. the VAE is not, the purpose of VAE is not to generate a vivid <laughs> images, it's just to recover the old image, right? Mm. And also one of the partial functions is that it will going to encode or train a train a new train a new and a sigma mm. for each sample, right? Yeah. For each sample, so so in this case, and the, that part of decoders may not somehow. For example, if the AC gains, if we train the AC gains applied on the VAE, mm. maybe the images, the constructed images, is more vivid, but looks different from the original images. That is, might be also possible. Hmm. But of course, if we, hmm. but of Maybe. course, if we, but of course, if we update the decoders, hmm. it also, when we train the VAE, it will update the encoder as well. So in this case, maybe, hmm. maybe, I just say maybe, I'm not sure whether this is hmm. gonna point it. What, I'm not sure whether we need an experiment to verify your second point, mm. but I, I fully agree with the, the first your first point. Mm. So in summary, we have covered what is Bayesian active learning. So we use dropout neural network as a Bayesian network, and we quantify the uncertainty from two aspects. Remember the formula I show, the uncertainty has two terms. The first term is model's uncertainty of a sample. The second term is model's disagreement upon a sample. Mm -hmm. And we estimate the uncertainty by dropout capital T times. Yeah. We also covered what is VAE is again. VAE tries to do dimensional reduction for an image and recover the information from an image, from a hidden vector. AC again can generate and discriminate image. Uh, so so uh, one, one of the questions about the combination of VAE and AC again here. So mm -hmm. if we would like to combine VAE and AC again, mm -hmm. we somehow need to unify their input, right? Or so we can see the VAE mm -hmm. will offer a random vector with the distribution uh, con con yeah. conform to distribution con conform yeah. distribution of mu and the sigma, mm. right? Mm. And as for AC games, it is supposed when we train it, it is somehow I mean the original AC game, it will fit into a random vector, right? There's no constraints for what these random vectors looks like, mm. right? Mm. So. If we want to combine VAE and AC gains, how do we decide mu and the sigma? Hmm. So given an image X from the encoder part, you can get a Z, right? Hmm. You can oh, use I got it, I got it, I got it. Z to train your AC gain. Hmm. Yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. Yeah, so I think the pure, hmm. I think the pure, maybe, you are right on a second point, but I'm quite unsure. And maybe it can be proved by some experimental or empirical um, results. But for the first one, I think the, the major idea is that how do we train a reliable gain, mm. rel reliable gain to do the data augmentation, right? So maybe mm. the, the authors start using AC gain at the very beginning and find that the gain may not introduce or generate a satisfying or perform a good job uh, in data augmentation or gener generate mm. the images with satisfying qualities. So it introduced VAE to improve the training process of AC again. Mm. So um, this is the idea of our idea mm. is that we first use space active learning to select an inform for example, then we use VAE AC again as a data augmentation technique, because remember the AAVAS again can input an image 
and it can generate another example based on the original image you fit in, which is as informative as the selected example. So um, first question is, why base active learning is better than traditional active learning? Because if you use traditional active learning to compute the uncertainty, then you have to literally train n ensemble models. But if you use Dropbox, you only need to train one network and Dropbox can produce two to the power of m ensembles. Mm. But that means if we train a, that means if we train a subset model, the subset model is supposed to somehow large, right? And also, it is a little bit, it, it will be a little bit tricky to decide mm -hmm. how much neuro we're going to drop out each time. Mm. Actually, you don't know what is the exact number of neurons to be dropped out. You you just control the rate of dropping out. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Um, the second question is why using VEAC again as a data augmentation is better than random augmentation because for random augmentation it does not guarantee to generate informative samples also the data augmentation is generated from the original training data as the training goes on they become no longer informative because they have been because those training have been seen by the model many times. Yeah. So those informative examples were likely to be uh, majorly correct as mm. the training goes on. Yeah. But for VEAC again, you can generate example close to your active learning example. So they are more likely to be informative than random data annotation. So I, I sorry, I maybe mm. my question is not really re relevant to your mm. your point here. So I'm asking, is there any possibility that given a subject model, uh, is the entropy or the model giving the entropy of the, your ensemble model mm. very consistent? Uh, means that entropy will be very small, but I still make a wrong prediction. Yeah, it's possible, but it, uh, it is not considered as informative. No, um, that would be informative. That means because it is harder for the model to correct this type of error, right? If you want to correct this type of error, you may need to sacrifice a lot of other data that is around yeah, that, this so, code. Yeah, yeah, that is one Charles, job, one Charles work. So suppose we are already now giving the model, right? Giving the model, Mm. So, because given a model, if you if we say it's a buggy model, if we're using active learning, so the active learning is would be used for as long as the model is actually expressive enough. If the model mm. itself is not expressive enough, uh, so the, the, the idea of uncertainty may not be it anymore. So that means even certain, even even certain, uh, even certain model, it will actually very certain on the wrong answer or on a wrong prediction. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So I think debugging will actually have very different stage. So maybe we can provide some empirical or practice to, to elicit to elicitate some some debugging practice later. So that, so sorry for interrupting. It's not that irre irrelevant to your mm. keep please keep going. Mm. Mm. So the approach is like, uh, first of all, I have a model trained on small training data set, capital D. Then I use the model and the Bayesian formula to select informative sample X star from unlabeled data pool. We will send this X star to Oracle to get the ground truth Y star. We then feed the pair x star y star into VEAC again to generate x prime y star with the with the same ground truth label as x star because um, because AC again can take 
in the class label. Yeah. So you can generate an image falls into the same class. And this x prime is as informative as x dot. Mm, so no. in this case, we only need to, eh, so, sorry, for how many x prime do we generate? X, x star oh x prime. Uh, so given x star we definitely oh, given x star we just generate one x prime why so we we assume you can generate as many x prime as possible right yeah because yeah if you run the vac again for Many times, then you will generate different x prime because there is randomness inside the ESK. Mm. And we do not need to label those x prime anymore because we just yeah. need to label the ones. And uh, ACK yeah. is supposed to generate the images of the same label or the same mm. class. Mm. But in the paper, they just generate once. Generate, I mean, generate the x prime one only for once. I think so. Yeah, I think so. But every time they will select a uh, top 100 X star, then generate uh, 100 X per. Okay. Mm. But also reasonable. Um, okay, now we have two new data, X star and X prime. We can add them into label data set D and update the weights in classify. And meanwhile, we also update the weights for VE and AC again. So the three networks co-evolve together. Mm. Uh, I have a question here. So once we using some uh, Bayesian formula mm. or some in sample model, in sample deep learning model to generate a X star and labels Y star, uh, mm. My question is, isn't it possible to just apply existing data augmentation approach on X, X, uh, X star, not using the game, just using the simple approach to this? Do they evaluating this part? Because they somehow inventing a novel data augmentation approach. But what if they just using some normal or traditional data augmentation approach, for example, rotating uh, ro rotations, blurrings, uh, something like that. Uh, and, and, and given the, your AC games, you still would like to uh, generate something similar, right? Yeah. So from mm. my point of view, given the games, of course, it will, can provide more diversity. By right, it can provide yeah, yeah, yeah. diversity. But what mm. if we're just using the traditional data augmentations to do the rotation blurring, and maybe they have the same effect? Mm. But if you do the traditional data augmentation, then mm. similar. So from the high level picture, it is similar. But as, mm. as long as I find an informative example, I just perturbate the sample a little bit. And maybe again, it will be perturbated a little bit far away. But for data augmentation, it's perturbated a little bit nearby. Right. So yeah. when the if I'm the reviewer, I'm going to ask that, what if they replace AC game with the traditional data augmentations and will, and will the model have maintained pre or preserve the same performance or the performance will getting worse? Mm. Or maybe I, even they, they didn't do this experiment. And is they getting, because the idea is really novel yeah mm. i think this is all the baseline it has mm. so so the first one is only using veac again but with without using active learning so the generation of new sample depends on only training data you have sorry only va again so if they do not have active learning what's the point for them to do the data augmentation Oh, they, they do the data augmentation. Uh, based on training, based on training, based not based on active learning data now. Okay, sure, I see. Yeah. And the red line is paper's approach. Green line is uh, just use AC again, but without VAE. Mm. Yeah. 
the dark blue line is only using Bayesian active learning, but no additional data annotation. Mm -hmm. the, the black line is like a um, lower bound because this is just random active learning, random selection of informative sample. Mm. Yeah, if we're going to do active learning, will it be our our baseline? It published in uh, last year, no, the two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can keep these papers and if we want to develop some new active learning approach. But I think our active learning approach is apply on object detection model. Mm. Okay, let's keep going on. So, and also you can see the X axis is the number of acquisition iteration or the percentage of training sample. So if you if the model only looks at 55% of training, it can already reach the accuracy if we train on the full training data set. So yeah, it can save the labeling effort. Okay. Hmm. It did its evaluation on four data sets. All those four data sets are classification data. And they use two architectures, ResNet 18 and ResNet 18 PA. Hmm. Um, they also look at the classification accuracy at a particular time point, which is 26% uh, of training has been labeled, and they observed that the paper's approach is significantly better than the other classification accuracy. Mm. These are the images generated by the VEAC again. Looks very authentic. Okay, can we go back to the previous one? <clears throat> and this one is going to, uh, is this one a uh, data, uh, that means that this is a 50% of data after we using active learning. Uh, what do you mean by this, the, the first thing? Hmm? Classification accuracy. Yeah, classification accuracy. 26% of training has been labeled. What do you mean by this sentence? Oh, it's like here you have the percentage of, percentage of training samples sent by the model, right? So now I take a time slice at 26%, which is maybe around here, mm -hmm. around here for different data set. Then I look at, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. So the takeaways here is that this paper normally combines active learning and data augmentation to generate more informative examples. Mm. In particular, use Bayesian active learning to replace traditional active learning and Bayes again for data augmentation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very excellent uh, presentation. And uh, given that our topic is for active learning model, I think these concepts, at least for me, is also a kind of active learning to me to mm. update my knowledge of the deep learning, deep learning neural network model. Mm. Uh, I think Rufan, we may keep this paper in mind, and if necessary, we somehow re-implement their approach. And we think about, mm. let's think about how this approach, for example, the, the game-based approach or the, the entropy or the in sample based approach can be applied on object detection model because we have tried ob object detection models a lot of times ourselves so we can uh, get we get our hands dirty and wet i suppose that we have experience to have a more deeper uh, insight into uh, invent some novel ideas and uh, support the state of the art mm. okay. okay thank you last turn for wang chao Hello, Wang Chao. Yeah. Can Hello. you guys share, oh. see my sharing? Yeah. Okay, so 
Today, I'm going to present the paper Opening the Black Box of Deep Neural Network via Information. Mm. Uh, and uh, it is published on Archive 2017. And it's by uh, Revit, Schwartz, Siv, and uh, Natal uh, Natalie Tischbein. And uh, these two also all come from Hebrew University. And the first but also- It looks like they're from Israel. Right, here. Yeah, they are Israel, yeah. Mm. And uh, the first author is a PhD student of the second author. And uh, the first author is, uh, the area is folk develop, uh, is to develop a deep understanding of DNNs based on information theory and to implement it over large scale problems. So mm. actually the paper present today is like sub summarize his area very well. And the second author is uh, uh, Naftali Tishbai, and uh, it's a professor, and uh, it's also a computational neuroscientist. So it's so uh, his area that is related to today's presentation is actually uh, he is uh, also who have published a theory called informational uh, information bottleneck, and the first author have developed this um, theory onto DNNs. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's the relation. Yeah. And, so uh, Oh, please, please go on. Yeah, and the Prof Tishbai uh, also work on the information series. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe one of the comments is that given your FYP project, we find there might be a limitations for the neural network models uh, to and how expressive of the neural network models. So this was actually uh, somehow related to the problem of encoding problem. So getting a large number of information and how much and how can a model encode uh, encode the given information? So if, for example, we have maybe 1,000 uh, numbers and we only have maybe maybe five bytes, it's definitely with these five bytes cannot encode that 1,000 numbers, right? But if we consider this encoding, the encoding process as neural network models, and whether it is possible for us to de develop in some theoretical foundation. For now, we are using just using empirical trial and errors. We find that we're just keeping the same neural numbers. We're just moving the, we're just moving the architectures. And we find that if this architecture is more expressive than the others. And then we somehow adding the neurons on different layers. We find the, in, in, the expressiveness actually improve. So we do this just by the empirical studies, whether we can develop some theoretical foundation to see such kind of move, such a move operations can improve its encoding capability. And how much neuron we increase can further improve the, the, the expressiveness. And why uh, the marginal benefits of the neuron addition decrease, right? We observe that when we're adding more neurons, for example, if we add maybe 5% of the neurons, we can uh, maybe maybe we, maybe we added 200 neurons, if I remember correctly, and it, it, we can improve 3% of the prediction accuracy. Uh, but if we added maybe 1,000 1,000 more neurons, and the accuracy can only predict by can, the accuracy only can improve by 1%. So why the and why is such a marginal benefit? Why such a phenomena where the marginal benefit surface degrees happens? So we might be interested to investigating this kind of questions. So they are very also very interesting. Maybe let's see how we can, what we can borrow from the idea of this paper. Okay, so I'll continue. So, um, uh, so uh, Prof. Tishbai made a presentation on Ber in, Ber uh, in Berlin on 2018 of this paper. And uh, uh, Geoffrey Hinton, who is also considered the father of deep learning, says that I have to listen to it another one ten thousand times to really understand it. But it's very rare nowadays to hear a talk with a really original idea in it that may be the answer to a real major puzzle. Mm -hmm. So uh, the father of uh, uh, deep learning gave uh, this paper a very high, a very high uh, comment. comment. Yeah. yeah. So. But so, the problem is that I cannot find the venue where the pub, the paper is published. Yes, yes. It's also I just 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 say it's on archive. Yeah, I cannot find this, this paper where. But citation is supposed to be very high, right? 
Ah, uh, yeah, it's about 200 or 300, yeah. Mm. So, oh, okay, so I uh, forgot the animation part. Uh, yeah, so first, uh, we I have mentioned that this paper is on top of information, no, uh, information about next six theory. So before that, before the actual presentation of this paper, we need to first understand what is information botnet theory. So there's a lot of technical uh, words, so I will try my best to make everything clear. So we need to first define what is mutual information here. So Ru Fan has mentioned some, like, some bit about it. So mutual information can basically define as a common information that is uh, inside the X and the Y. And it is it is defined by the KL divergence from PX to Y, uh, PY, uh, PXY to PX times PX, PY, yeah. So after normalizing this uh, formula, we can get that the, uh, so you can, we have found that this I, X, Y can be considered as the entropy of X minus the entry, condition entropy of X from Y. Mm, yep. Let me let me recap here. here. So the care divergence of p comma y and p x times p y. So it means that. Uh, okay. So it means that how how different when and how likely p x and p y occur all together. Yeah. Mm. I think somehow it measures uh, upon knowing y what is the information you can have on X? Because if X and Y are totally independent, then P joint distribution of X and Y is equal to PX times PY. Then your mutual information is equal to zero. In other words, if you know Y, you know nothing about X because these two are independent, right? Yeah. Mm. So let, uh, let, me, let me recap this here. So you mean the PX, uh, Okay, so I got it. Yeah, got it. right. So mm. that means so how dependent x and y are. Right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. But actually, you can see this is actually symmetric. So mm. you can change it to yeah. So it's such symmetric form. But yeah. Mm. So it's symmetric. Yeah. So next, uh, knowing the mutual information, we can go to the theory itself. So the theory says that if we want to compression or re-encode the information from A to B, there are conflicts between keeping the mutual information between A and B, which is I, A, B, I have mentioned, and the compressing the bit rate of B. So which is also very clear. So we, if we want to keep the mutual information, we have to have enough bit rate to B to store all of them. Yeah, that's the information bottleneck theory itself. And it also says that a Markov chain can be considered as a kind of information recording. So uh, what is Markov chain? The Markov chain is, uh, that's actually something copied from Wikipedia. So it's a model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state attained in previous events. So which means that if we have a um, micro chain x uh, y to x, so the what is happening x is only related to what in y, and uh, and but it's a problem, what but it's related to probability. So it's not a one hundred percent translation, but a probability related translation. So moreover, the DNN is a Markov chain. So for example, we have uh, x, we will uh, certainly have the, uh, let me go to the next uh, page first. So, so um, uh, it says that the DNN can be viewed as a Markov chain. Why to do so? Uh, so we can first, um, like, uh, so this is an MLP model, a very common MLP model in the world. So uh, now, uh, the definition is that the Y is a label, X is a feature, T is the intermediate features. So in every step in the for the, for all hidden layers, it can be viewed as an encoder decoder model. So the first half for this is an encoder, and the second half is a decoder. 
So that's a key idea here. And why it is a Markov chain? It is because this the signal here is only depend on this signal, and this and the signal here is only depend on this signal. So it's a Markov chain. Yep. So that's how it gives the definition of the Markov chain, and how it's we. Certainly, it's certainly something come in my mind uh, to to show the expressiveness to to evaluate the expressiveness of the model. So maybe we can evaluate the entropy of each layer. So we're going to see whether there is entropy loss between layer I and layer I plus one. So once, suppose the entropy information can always keep, keep, keep among the, the layers, it means that entropy are not lost, right? Yeah, but actually it's not entropy are not lost, but information are not lost. The entropy is a, well, it's a, it's a way to evaluate the inform information. Yeah, but um... but somehow if so, yeah, you're right. So suppose that giving this neuron, give two neurons as for BB. Suppose you've given the pictures, and how do we evaluate the entropy of a set of picture? It is somehow uh, a little bit difficult. Let's yeah, so there's a slide afterwards to say how to compute uh, uh, mutual information uh, and uh, the entropy and this, uh, so such stuff here. But I will do it later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. So uh, there's also another uh, data processing inequality chains when considering Markov chain. It says that the mutual information of X, Y, so will be decreasing. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's quite clear, right? If the mutual information is here, then after another Markov chain, the mutual information of Y is decreased, uh, it somehow decreased, yeah. So that's how this uh, inequality chains uh, has. Yeah. So next, next, after knowing what is mutual information, we can now know uh, to draw a mutual information plane with x, y axis, i, t, y, and the x axis, i, x, t. So what is i, t, y? It means that the information about output means, oh, okay. So T is a hidden layer. So it can, can be any hidden layer. So it's actually TI should be better. So T should be any hidden layer. For example, they are uh, like in the model, uh, in the picture, there are five layers. And this is uh, layer, layer five, like layer four, layer three. So uh, actually these lines is one state. This line is another state. And this line is another state. So all these lines are drawn in different training approach, uh, epis, epochs of the trainings. But for example, for this line, uh, for this dot, so, so it's, it's the beginning of the training. So we can say that we can see that it has very least information of the output signal, which is here, y axis. And it also have a very little information about the input data. So which is X axis. So it's here. So it's layer five. But for layer one, because it is very close to the input data. So for example, layer one is here. So you may see that uh, it has a very most information about the label and the very most uh, information of the in input data. And our final goal is to like moving this dot upwards to some place where the final layer knows the information about output data. Uh, final layers. So, okay. So the final year epic, uh, epoch, uh, in the let, final epoch. Let me, let me label. So this is epoch one, epoch one. Yeah. Epoch two. And this is epoch n, right? Yeah. Epoch and so actually when we app so here let, let me let's let me rank the epoch zero. In epoch zeros, so in layer five, layer five is the last layer, right? Yeah, it's a last layer. Last layer have last layer have very little information. In terms right. of the uh, layer five and output. Yes. Okay, so all, I got, got it. So for the layer ones, it will always have the corresponding information. Yeah, because it's very close to the output, input. Yeah, correct. It's very close to in how, uh, 
Yeah, maybe I, I still have a little confusion. Is that? Yeah, you may you may just ask. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just ask later. So I just put a question here, uh, just to re reinforce our memory. So that I, the question is that, given the images and how do we know it's mutual information? Okay, so that's a very good question. So actually, um, this the answer is unknown. So mm -hmm. I, actually, uh, so they, the prof, they, for this one, actually they use a uh, self-made data. So they made the data itself to evaluate the mutual information instead of the real world. So, uh, so that's also caused a problem uh, so in, if, uh, for this mutual information in real data set because uh, the way to evaluate is unknown and the problem is does not want to um, publish their method to evaluate the mutual information actually. So mm. they want to like open a company based on their approach. Can uh, I ask a question? Yeah, you can ask. Um, why is like a V shape? Because for layer five, firstly, the information about input data increases, then yes. it decreases. Yeah, that's uh, what's it. So this actually is what the finding of this paper. They said oh. that uh, we can, okay. there are two phase and uh, there are explanation later. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, so, so. Oh, so sorry, so, so this is information about input data and this is output data, so. So, so Ruofan is asking there's a V shape, right? So it's giving the last layer, the representation of the last layer, it will first increase and then get, getting decreased. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, if you know a Chinese, uh, very famous Chinese uh, yeah, you call the Ba Shu Du Bo Za Ba Shu Du Bao, that is what it, uh, uh, the, how the author. You mean the Ba Shu Du Ho? Ah, uh, 对, Ba Shu Du Ho Za Ba Shu Du Bao. That is what um, means. So it will try to first uh, gain all the knowledge that it provided. Then it will summarize what is truly important about why. So that's why. So it is discarding only uh, the irrelevant information in input data, but only to grasp those is important in input data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so, I'll, so, I'll actually so, give more detailed explanation later. Okay. So the idea is that given the output, it will, anyway, so it's still always in the process of giving more information. Yeah. But for its own information, it's somehow in the process of introducing more noise and remove the noise, right? More like a feeling, have a feeling like this. Mm. Right. So, so give, you... from the process of from A to C, it's a process yeah. of introduce noise, but of course, it also will introduce some valuable information. And yeah, in, the later, in, the, in the later stage, it will try to um, keep or preserve the valuable information and remove the noise. Yeah. Okay. So next part, uh, next one will be the um, how to compute MI on DL. So actually, I would say uh, too long, don't read. So. Uh, that's why I myself do not very got a very good understanding of it because uh, that one is related to a very uh, uh, special uh, function called the spherical harmonic power spectrum. So I don't even know what it is. So let let me introduce how the how they uh, set this experiment. So, First, wait, wait, let me suspend you here. So I would like to give a very good, uh, uh, so I'm going to say that one job provide a very good uh, template of the VM flow. So if you would like to very little time to read a paper and how can you accurate, how can you accurately find the structure of the paper and, uh, and extract the most information, as much information as possible. So you can see that from this paper, so one child was in synchronized with me that he has only one or two days to read this paper and prepare the presentation. And like giving one child's presentation, I think he has already, at least for me, raised my uh, utmost curiosity to investigating his talk. While he is still, still very faith, uh, clearly and, faith, and, and, and honestly showing that which part it is uh, still a black box for us. And if we would like to investigate it, you can read a paper by your own. So 
so all the always Wang Chao, I feel that he is not the one pay most effort to reading every detail like Ruo Fan. But anyway, Ruo Fan is a PhD student. But but Wang Chao is one of the I would say kind of clever or very articulate point is that his his architecture and his structure, his his presentation structure is very clear and maybe that it was a very useful technique, uh, learnable, quite learnable. So I think this, his presentation always set a, some kind of a good example for this kind of the technique. So I just make a few comments here. What are please going on? Okay, so let me first introduce the model they use in the, in the experiment. So it is a, a simple N, a MLP model with six layers. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And the input is uh, six, 12, uh, is 12 neurons, and the output is two neurons, which is, yeah. So that's next, let me introduce the input. So actually the, the input they use are binary input. So uh, these 12, 12 binary inputs represents 12 uniform distributed points on 2D sphere. So you can simply think that they are, the input they use uh, have this uh, 4K, a possible uh, distributions. Combination. Yeah, yeah. So this, there are such combinations, and uh, you can consider the x as a now can consider x as a discrete random variable. Okay, so I will pause you here. Xiangling, do you still remember the binary neural network models went through in our discussions yesterday? Mm. So it's the name called Yang Zhong, right? So yeah, Yang Zhong. Yeah, he he is working. He is working, but also he has worked on the binary explanation. So Wang Chao is working. Now talking about a very typical binary uh, DNA here. Hmm. Yeah, and so uh, what's why is they you they want to use these twelve inputs because uh, this twelve x can be evaluated through this special function and can be can get um, uh, something physical in real life and this real life can be considered as label one and two one and zero. So that's the usage of this 12. So the question here is that I, I now understand the, the layer one is binary. Does all the layers are binary? Uh, no. So that's the second part, a uh, third part. Mm. For each, so for each uh, intermediate layer, actually uh, the, now the um, random variable are concrete, uh, continuous, right? So to discrete them, so actually they bind each input into 30 beams from minus one to one. So uh, I saw, well, sorry, I forgot to remember, uh, uh, say that it's the tangent edge uh, activation they use. So the, all the range are from minus one to one. So they bind each, each one to these 30 beams. So now it's again, a discrete bind random variable. Bind each TI, each TI is layer, right? Uh, the actually each signal in TI. Oh, each signal in TI into 30 beams. From... Okay, so so somehow you just uh, have uh, 30 intervals in the... Yes, yeah, you can say that uh, they put the... Or, or, or original the signal are continuous from minus one to one. Mm, now it has, has separated to yeah. uh, 30 intervals. So mm. now, it's, now it's discreet. Oh, discreet. Okay. Ah, yeah, dis dis discreet, yeah. So... Mm. Uh, so now we we have uh, all the layers and output discrete, right? So mm -hmm. after uh, so knowing uh, after translating them to discrete one, so so they trade fifty random models and they evaluate the mutual information. So the question here: Why we need to train fifty random models? So actually, the reason is that. For one certain model, actually the transaction are fixed. So why we say so? Because for certain X, the certain T are actually are confirmed, are fixed here, right? For uh, e uh, sorry, will you please repeat? So what do you mean by transaction? Uh, I mean the uh, I have mentioned that DNN is uh DN is oh, uh, transition. you mean transition. A uh, transition, yeah. Okay, no transaction. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. it's my bad. So transition uh, from each layer is uh determin deterministic. 
So from X, uh, for each model, if we have an X, actually all the TIs here are fixed, right? So uh, it's hard to say it's a run. So uh, the, we cannot say it's a random variable, but uh, a kind of fixed one. So they used uh, 50 random models to evaluate the uh, evaluation. It means that event. those Ran, uh, those mo random models share the same behavior. Uh, actually, they share the they share the same model structure, but not the weight. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, now they definitely. Otherwise, there's no point to giving yeah. fifty models. My question is that they when train the fifty models, they supposed to have share the same behaviors, or they have the similar prediction on the same batch of the in, the, the input. Uh, actually, uh, they do not have the same. Uh, they have so how they train it and how they predict it are all the same. So so, so the way of training is sim all the same. So they just random sample from this X and then train it, and then up after training these fifteen random variables, so they just check, like we in input this for four K kind of axis and how will these TIs distribute, and then. He, from this uh, distribution of TI, they uh, evaluate these two mutual information. Okay, so just that's, that's what did you mention that they're using some fake or self -conscious. Yeah, so they, they use uh, fake data. So that's the fake data they use. And uh, yeah, so so the so evaluating the mutual information on, information, uh, on images are unknown now. Mm. Because we cannot, it's actually it's very hard to distrib, uh, to say that how the data set follow what kind of distribution. Mm. So they have to manually define one. So that's how they do it. I think the from the input level is not possible, but from intermediate level, for example, for images, it's very hard for us to take the input of these layers. But as long as it has been transformed into a convolution layers or average yes. layers it becomes possible yeah we can know actually we can know the mi uh inter in the all the ti's but we actually what we know we want is the information to here so mm -hmm. that's the question so okay after knowing how to compute mi on deep learning so next will be the contribution of this paper so in this paper actually mainly uh, have three pound uh three parts so it first shows that the DN training undergoes two distinct phase consistent of an uh, initial fitting phase and a subsequent compression phase, what is mentioned by rule fan. So the shape is like V-like. So yeah. yeah, so it's the finding of this paper. And it also says that the comp compression phase is occurs, uh, occurs due to the diffusion-like behavior of stochastic gradient descent. Oh, sorry, what do you mean by diffusion? Okay, so I will I will illustrate later, right? Yeah, sure. Later, but you, if you want to know, I will just. Oh, no, 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 no hurry, no hurry. But you may just uh, yeah. give us some. Yeah. So it's a, some. It's a, just a, like a, uh, so it's just like an increasing of entropy, something like that. So if we want to, for example, we have a, a so bo box more, more, like a, more like a. Fusion and diffusion. Fusion means that we no no it's diffusion diffusion core sign. No, no. Yeah, I understand what diffusion means. So I mean that the two distinct phase and the the first phase is called fusion, and the next phase is called diffusion. So first, uh, for example, if we have something uh, here like the only the left box have uh, some particles and the right 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 box don't have. If you remove this one here under the self uh, so under some time, so after some time it will be all all here. Mm. So it's because it's the way of the entropy increase. So mm. yeah, so that's a diffusion like what what this diff diffusion like behavior means. But I will explain more later. Yeah, and uh, it also shows the advantage of using more hidden layer than using less. So let's. Uh, illustrate them one by one. So first, uh, what is two-phase training? So uh, it may not be clear of the two-phase training from one single image. So they provide uh, a video to show that. So I will play it to you. So it's quite short. 
So you can just say that, uh, okay, let's start from the beginning. So you can see at the beginning, uh, so actually the settings are same. So this one are higher layers, inter, inter, uh, medium layers and uh, lower layers. Yeah. So you can see from, let, let's see the result. So you can see that at the first, all the orange line go to right, right and the right top corner. And then it goes, start to in a very slow uh, diffusion phase and uh, or compression phase and it start to go to left up corner. So you can see the in the final way it all go to the left up corner. Okay, so I think this video is very clear about the two phase and uh, if we plot it into one single single line, a uh, single image is something like this. So it describes how the MIs on information planes change. Yeah, if you, have anyone got this, got any questions? If anyone have the question, please just ask. Oh, uh, hello. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. If the information about output label reaches one, then does it mean that the model is overfitting? Yes, so it says that uh, the model, uh, this may, for this, uh, so, stage, so for this stage, there is no concept of overfitting, I guess, it's only fit well. So it means that it fits uh, well. So actually oh. because the data, it, 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 so it is basically uh, based on the data it provides. So oh. mm. yeah, because the data the prior is the real data, the data from real distribution, a uh, real distribution, mm. right, you recall that. So mm. if they pro provide 100% real data to it and it can pr perform one, mm. it means that it uh, have masked, uh, mask, yeah. so, master all yeah. the true so, data. Wang Chao presented is that uh, how well a model can encode or fit an existing a bunch of samples. But of course, so the overfitting problems usually mm -hmm. uh, lies, in, uh, mm -hmm. lies in that the distribution or the data very different, looks very different or the mm -hmm. model does not, uh, the model overfitting, uh, the model fit too well the problem. But here we're talking about how can the model, how can we design a model which can fit well, right? Yeah, but yeah, but it does also, also says the compression phase may lead to overfitting because uh, in the true situation, the input data may uh, have noise and uh, so, yeah, and uh, so, and uh, the input data may have bias. So if it only considers, uh, so while discuss, discarding the invariant information in input data, it may discard something that is truly important uh, about the label. Yeah, so that may cause information, be uh, sorry, uh, which may cause under the overfitting because of this compression phase. Yeah, mm -hmm. and our okay. FYP project is almost like uh, we are trying to try our best to overfit, right, or fitting. Yeah. So, uh, so it has uh, like five stages, but uh, I have already go through it once before at the first step, but uh, so I won't read them again. So it's quite clear. So at the beginning, all low, then start to go to right up corner because it start to fit and uh, go to left upper corner because uh, it start to compress. And in the final state, it mentions that it achieves the optimal balance of the accuracy and the compression. So uh, it, it's just final reached uh, balance. Yeah. So next, next is the explanation from the author of the compression stage happens. So it says that the representation compression phase occurs due to the diffusion like behavior of stochastic gradient descent. You can see from the right, right uh, image, it shows that the, at first the mean of the gradient are dominating the group the STD of the gradient. But after some while, like this here, the STD, which means the standard deviation uh, of the gradient start to dominate, or no, it's not dominant, but start to affect the real uh, way of the means of the gradient. So it start to make things diffusion. So make things uh, more randomized. So that's why uh, in here, uh, so it depends on how we initialize. <clears throat> it depends it, on how we initialize the weights, right? It does not matter how we initialize weight, but after some training step, uh, the 
STD will dominate the mean. Mm. So you can see the the gradient. Uh, the the gradient. Okay, so so from the very beginning, I think the gradient are are very similar, but after a while, so it it is it is in, it is intuitive, right? Somehow, but it, yeah. yeah, but the point is that the average of the gradients on decrease. Yeah, the average the magnitude of average. Uh, average gradient is, is average. So, so average here because some gradients is uh, so here is means absolute value of the gradient or yeah, absolute value of the gradient it decrease. Yeah, so, okay, so the, the key idea is that the that means the gradient so the network learn something, yeah. Right. So, the so gradient, uh, as long as it's a positive, uh, so it's a, as long as it has uh, this value is bigger than zero, it means that the network is learning. But this, uh, but although it is learning, uh, is there a different way of learning? So it can be a very fast uh, learning all the input data. It's kind of learning, but uh, also mastering only the inf relevant uh, data is also kind of learning. So it's it, like- Sorry, uh, what's your last sentence? I mean, so there are two phases, right? Mm. So this phase can be considered as a learning process, but this phase can also be considered as a learning process. Mm. Yeah, so that's, so this point here is the interchange point. So this uh, STD start to make the uh, weights shuffle more or change more to inco so instead, so we need, uh, let me see how, how to say it in a better way. So to encode such information, there are many possible ways, right? But this STD are trying to make such weight more uh, using less bits. Yeah, that's how it says. Use less bit. Use less bit means, uh, I didn't get a how, what do you mean by using less bit? Be uh, because the network has been encoded, the, the architecture has been defined, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, how they say that is that um, it's very hard to describe. So maybe I, let, let me show why it's like diffusion first. Mm. So, uh, so first we need to know what is diffusion in real world because so it simply goes from a state with lower entropy to a higher entropy, like the, what is shown in right upper corner, so this image here. So it's the left one have the lower entropy, but the right one have a higher entropy. And uh, the author says that uh, it should be the same for SGD, but what it does is it increases the conditional entropy. And uh, under the under this uh, observation, uh, while the conditional entropy is increased, the mutable information is decreased. That's how they explain about this phenomenon. Uh, the conditional entropy is increased and the mutual independence, all the mutual information is decreased. Yeah. Uh, our goal is to make sure the mutual dependency keeps increasing, right? Uh, no need for X actually. So at, we are now talking about the X, but we want to actually, we want to mask as long as uh, Y T is increasing, it is fine. But now it is discussion of uh, Y T X. So yeah, um, this is the one we want to truly master and it is actually yeah, yeah. increasing. Yeah, yeah, the I, I, T, Y, we will actually keep it increasing. But yeah. for I, T, X. Yes, it says. It means it says that it will like to the first, the first increase. So under the constraint of, mm. of Y, under the constraint of Y, mm. uh, it will decrease. Make the each layer makes the makes the mutual 
dependency between each layer and x to be decreased later. Yes, so they said because it's a, it's a behavior of SGD and uh, it will increase the entropy, so the mutual information will be decreased. Any more intuitive explanation for this? I don't think I got one because uh, at, uh, I actually this explanation is what I explained from their explanation. So their explanation is more hard to understand. Okay, let's keep let's keep going because we have take a long time in this presentation. Yeah. Okay. So, so at uh, what I al al also said is that it uh, also may explain why uh, it uh, some model way may cause overfitting because uh, it uh, it start to discard uh, information in X, but some informations may be important under uh, not truly uh, well given data set. Okay, next will be, so as a result of uh, for compression, it says that there's no, uh, so interpreting individual weights on uh, one certain layer is meaningless because anyways, the uh, weights will be uh, changed to, uh, uh, to change it to a way that is the entropy is the, hard, uh, is the highest. So uh, there's no way, uh, no meaning interpreting individual weights there. So it also says the structure is more important than weights. Okay, next. Next is how they explore uh, the effects of adding more hidden layer. So uh, to understand this graph, we need to first look at the right lines uh, right here. So it means the epoch. So you can see that uh, there's the epoch needed for the model to finally fit the uh, data. So you can ob obviously see that with higher, uh, with more hidden layers, uh, it start to reduce number of training and for, for good generalization. So, yeah. So oh, sorry, I didn't get it. Why, why more number of layers were, were allows more good uh, generalization? Okay. It's, uh, so, uh, the first means that to get the same good generalization, uh, more hidden layers will take less time because uh, the generalization are here, right? So this is the same generalization level. So for the model to- And how do you know this is generalization level? Gener generalization model means that we would like to apply on some data which have never seen in the training data. Yeah. Because it's all the training here are all, or they all use like 80% of data to train. So, yeah, so, so this is the data for data for testing data or training data? So uh, test data. It's for test data. So actually there's no test data or train data here. So they, they got 4096 uh, kind of input. Like they only feed in 80% of them to train and during evaluate they use the whole of them to evaluate. Uh, do you got what I, I got mean? A, a, what I, I got I mean. So anyway, the higher the better. Yeah, the higher the better. The more information, uh, the better. And you see that it never reaches one because it only uses eighty percent of data to train. Mm. And by the way, you think and an explanation for why this? So this is just a result, right? This graph is just a result. Yeah, this is a result of adding more hidden layers. So you can see that the first, uh, the red part, which is means many, oh, sorry, the yellow part, which means many epoch takes a very long time here. And uh, after we add in layers, the uh, uh, yellow part start to shrink. And uh, now it's- uh, mm. Oh, vaccine. by the way, in our, in our FYP project, when we are increasing the nodes or increasing more, more, more neuron, neurons, uh, in each layers, and have you collected? Have you ever observed their testing accuracy? Uh, yes, I have evaluated their testing accuracy. Uh, the accuracy are uh, increased, but uh, the part is not that far as uh, increasing from the training accuracy. So it means that uh, well, yes, like the 
it's like five percent in training uh in training will only increase one percent in test but anyway so adding neurons will still uh will still adding neurons will yeah we'll still try, we'll try to generalize improve the generalizability yeah correct so, i'm asking that uh, given that we still uh somehow we will still if we would like to for now we are our choices or or operation is we just moves the neurons among these layers. So I'm thinking about whether we can create a new layers by moving some neurons there. Yes, we can. We can test. So because we can they, have a test. Yeah, because they're saying that the <laughs> more layers can. In, in, yeah, and the, they says it is mainly because the compression phase uh, is faster from deeper, uh, from the deeper. So yeah. yeah. So that means it will make, uh, it means that it will, it will will make the mutual dependency decrease the mutual dependency between X and each layers sooner. Yep, that's what they, what they say, what they claim that. But uh, actually, I also attached a paper later that has a very different opinion of it but uh, I, I yeah because once do you remember what Rolf and once reported a paper it is showing that the more if anyway if you have focused a thousand layers or ten thousand layers a lot of layers share the same share the same information yeah or if there's a lot of redundancy layer redundant mm. layers it will incur the overfitting problems that because many layers and actually yes. uh uh extract very little information yes so mm. yeah so next will be the uh, so actually this is all what the paper came next i will talk something different like the paper with dif different op opinion so actually it's just say the the title of that paper is called on the information bottleneck theory of deep learning so this paper is just criticizing all the opinions in the uh, in this paper <laughs> So recall the contribution. There are uh, three main contributions, and uh, I highlighted the two, which is uh, most uh, the, the key point in that paper. And uh, in that paper, uh, so, so the first it says it will undergo two distinct phases, and the second it says it is due to the diffusion-like behavior of ST, SGD. So that paper is also that paper used used as a so used uh, this experiment. So say use ReLU instead of tangent edge. And uh, he you and uh, they say that for for all the layer here, they all have this compression phase. But here only the last layer have this compression phase. Mm. Yeah, so that's one. So they said uh, why this compression phase happens is mainly because oh sorry. Oh, and why this uh the last layer ha also have compression is because the last layer is uh it is a uh, classification layer and uh, it use sigmoid. So the last layer still has this compression, but if we uh, use, in other layer, we, we use ReLU, it will not have this one. Uh, and it says that uh, also, the uh, so reason why this happens is because uh, uh, because the activation function you choose for ReLU uh, as a, as something like this, right? So the difference, the difference is simply a, a, a line here. But for sigmoid and tangent edge, it's something like this. And the differentiate with something like this. And uh, he oh, says- sorry. sorry, so here you're talking about, uh, so the, so the, these two parts, wait a moment. So this is ReLU and this is uh, uh, tangent edge, right? The tangent uh, edge. Yeah. And, and what this, what, what this color do you mean? What is what... uh, the difference, uh, the, the differentiate of so, so D ReLU, so. Oh, you mean, oh, I see. So you first of all, the derivative, 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 the, the derivative, yeah. The derivative, okay. The derivative, yeah. Okay, so. Mm. So the first of all, derivative, so, mm. so he's, he says because. Oh, actually, if the derivative should look like this, right? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's something like this, but uh, it doesn't matter because he, so also is mainly saying that uh, it is because a change in derivative which causes compression phase, but not the, uh, yeah, that's uh, also in this paper claim. And the second, uh, he's, he also says that 
uh, so the, the compression phase is not related to the SGD because they use batch BGD instead of SGD. The result also shows this, this compression. So BGD, which means uh, batch, batch one, so, ah, uh, sorry, the whole one. So, so in, oh, in yeah, got it. The, the batch gradient difference. Yeah, batch gradient. So, yeah, so it shows that there's no difference between BGD and SGD. So may it may have diffusion like behavior. Oh, sorry, but, so here I would like to clarify the compression is this process, right? Yeah, Com compression is this process. He says that the compression is not caused by SGD. We, and uh, it is caused by the behavior of tangent edge. And the sigmoid should have the same the consequence. Yeah, so using different uh, ways of training doesn't affect the compression phase. So the compression phase happens mainly due to the behavior of tangent edge. So that's what is claimed in the paper I mentioned. I, I, I think a little bit weird is that, of course, I think using the tangent edge, but, but the problem is that the sigmoid and the tangent edge is, is monotonic. Right, it's always monotonic. So, and the compression means that the mutual dependency decrease. And yeah. how does the monotonic function will decrease the mutual information dependency? Uh, so that's, I didn't read from that paper. So it's very, uh, so actually uh, what I need to do is just say that oh, there are some other paper have very different very opinion very and they also have their supporting uh, experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's all for my present today. So any questions? Yeah, I think it's giving us a very interesting <clears throat> topic to investigate. And, uh, and, 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 and it, given that <clears throat> one class topics is kind of uh, tough and challenging, we, and the directions is still like a statistic uh perform in a static way we we're looking for sometimes uh, our very initial ideas seems to not go such well and uh, it also occurs to me that might be the initial model structure is not express enough unexpressive unexpressive structure somehow indicates uh, the encoding capability so that's why we look into this paper uh, yeah, we, but we still need to investigate how to getting this model is a little bit, it's very simple, very straightforward. Uh, from my part, maybe you can think about what, think, think about it uh, in terms of publications. I will have, have two points to comment. The first point is that if we re implementing some fundamental explanations, and we, if we find that our experiment can overthrow, can overthrow existing claim or theory and we somehow need to it will be have a quick publication for us like see this is from the utilitarian point of view and the second is that i think we need to have a more fundamental view into how encoding capability is actually so maybe one child for your for your fyps let's uh, stick with our plan i think our plan will yeah. lead to some results to see what is the perfect model structures given the limited or if we want to control control or control the number of neurons to enlarge or optimize its expressiveness and, then, and how it just relates to the gradients during the training process. I think that will be a very interesting topic to investigate. And in the meantime, maybe we together can think about giving those, maybe we can apply the same idea of the uh, mutual independencies to look into how the independency or entropy is evolved giving those architecture. That would be also, okay. also a very interesting topic for us to investigate. At least we can leave into evaluation. So maybe your our technical part uh, is kind of straightforward because it belongs to some empirical uh, findings. But in our evaluations, we can discuss it in a very sophisticated, sophisticated way. I think your examiner, I think Roger, Roger is very nice people. And I think he will appreciate our work indeed. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks everyone. I think this talk is, these two talk is sufficiently uh, informative. And I think even for me, I need to revisit these two, two talk 
but it's good that we have the uh, slides, we have the videos. Uh, I suggest that if you're interested, you can we can revisit these 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 papers offline. Okay, let's meet in next week. Thanks everyone for attending, and thank you all for one call for hey. giving this excellent information. Okay, bye. Let's go today.